Okay, I'm Tommy Concrete, and you are listening to the beautifully delicious. I said beautifully. I'll do it again. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, I'm Tommy Concrete, and you're listening to the brutally delicious podcast. How are you, man? Yeah. You doing all right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> What's it like over there, and is it starting to open up over there? Um, yeah, I think a bit too early. Oh yeah. Um, um so so we'll see. I, th- I, th- I think people are suddenly expecting everything to be like right. It's all going to be fine in two weeks. It's like I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what's happening here. Everything's. We went from everybody locked in to all the doors are wide open, and you can go do your thing. Yeah. So I, I don't want to be pessimistic, but I'm trying to be. Like oh, yeah. realistic, you know? oh yeah, Cause absolutely. We, you know, because we've had gigs booked, and then it just gets to wait to be about two weeks before, then it's cancelled. So, right, just, here we go. <laughs> All right. So, if you want, we'll just jump right in. Um, yeah. I've got a lot of stuff I want to talk about, so I don't know how much we'll get in here in this twenty minutes because there's a lot in your bio that was really interesting to me. I was looking forward to All this right. all day, but let's talk about is it Hex and Zirkle? Yeah. What was it like writing that record during this whole nonsense? Because I assume you wrote it during the pandemic, correct? Yeah, it was really strange <laughs> <laughs> because it was sort of like um, not particularly pleasant because it was it was quite an intensive thing that I did in quite a short period of time. Uh, so it drove me a little bit mental, but it also saved me from going completely mental because it was what I focused on and I wasn't thinking about everything going to shit and it was round about the time where we really didn't know i was like are we going to be in mad max territory so there's a lot of paranoia in that so it, it was quite stressful but it's uh did you find it purpose. did you find it cathartic um yeah yeah i suppose so i suppose so maybe it's a bit too soon for it to have that effect on me now uh, yeah. But maybe in a year's, a year's time, I'll look back at that and think, Phew, I got a lot out through that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You know? I mean, I, I assume there's no way to write a record in those sort of circumstances without pouring some of that in there, right? I mean, it's you're, you're pouring yeah. yourself in. Yeah, well, I mean, it was lyrically mainly. Uh, I mean, I was all, usually I spend a long time over the lyrics and get a big feeling. And I was like, no, the lyrics are going to be written in one go, each song in one go, about what happened that day, that afternoon, right. with no no forward planning. So it was like, this is, so the album is, well, this is about now, it's about a time. So according to your bio, a lot of the album deals with uh, psychosis that you were diagnosed yeah. with in 2009. Do you, let's, this a whole couple parts to this question, but first of all, do you feel vulnerable putting that stuff out there? Yeah. Uh, not now. Uh, a few years ago, I started to talk about like mental health thing, things um, <clears throat> seriously, and I put a whole bunch of lyrics out, and then I really wasn't prepared for having to talk in depth about it in situations like this. <laughs> right. And I, and I was like, fuck, I wish I'd <laughs> talked about wizards again. You know? <laughs> right. What the, <laughs> what the fuck? Whereas um, a couple of albums down the line have talked about things like that now, so I've put a, a few more boundaries up. Uh, around things that I actually I can't express, you know, without so, feeling. So yeah. I assume when you put yourself out there, you you connect with people that you wouldn't have thought you were going to connect with. What does that feel yeah. like? And do you have any good stories? Yeah. Well, I mean, it was like you just get weird things like uh, you, you just get private messages instead of private messages being things like, hey, that fucking solo ruled or something like that. <laughs> you know, you get people saying, you know, my, my son's autistic and he struggles and it was really cool that you came out and said that you were because that's helped right. or or I, I feel like that as well, you know. And so I've ended up getting quite a few, like I'm telling to an agony amp or something for mental health. But that's, <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't expect that, but that that's probably the best bit that they, you connect with people who think they're on their own and actually they're not. You know. Right. And I think that's one of the best things about music and media in general is you can yeah. you could be all the way where you are in Scotland and connect with somebody, you know, in rural Mississippi and they've got the same thing in common and they're not alone. And yeah, it's a yeah, it's a beautiful thing. 
yeah, yeah, it's it's um, because quite quite often it's easier as well because people they don't when they when you open up and you talk about something that's quite personal, uh, you also want the ability to not see that person again. <laughs> yeah, true, true. <laughs> if you don't if you don't want to, so if they're in a different country, you don't actually bump into them, then you, you can be a little bit more open without having to then be normal with them the next day you know because right, you don't have to follow them again after that you can just get it off yeah, your chest yeah. and be gone yeah i guess yeah. that makes sense yeah so i guess my biggest question when reading your bio was the synesthesia yeah yeah i've seen that on, on on the news and i've never really spoken to anybody who has that sort of thing what is yeah. that like and how how does that influence what you're writing well it it never used to because I was. It was only when I started to take control and be positive about myself. Before it was something that happened after the fact, like oh, I have this synesthesia thing. Well, whereas now I've started to embrace it. Be like, well, let's let's like use it. Yeah. So rather than for people that don't know that are listening, it, it's I can I can see sound and I can hear and taste color. So. Uh, when I listen to a really great album, uh, for example, Motorhead is one of my favorite band. It's very orange. The music is very really? orange to me and the certain sort of shapes. And I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if maybe could I draw the shapes that the album should make if it's perfect and then try and make music to fit the shapes? But what about that? Let's reverse that. So I tried that and uh, I followed it through and it was it was surprisingly easy which is i mean why wouldn't it be it's my skill but you know society at large doesn't have that and so it makes it seem like it would be difficult but yeah so it was all quite um it was an unusual process so, <laughs> so I, I hope you don't mind me asking but yep. when you're writing though so are you writing the music and then getting a feel or a taste or a, a and then writing your lyrics that way or how does it does that make any sense i, I don't I guess from someone who doesn't understand it, it's it's difficult. So I'm just trying to figure out how that plays into what you're writing. Um, well, I suppose the, the, the best way for people, everyone everyone is, has synesthesia to a certain extent. But if, if you think about, say, if you're going to drink uh, a, a, a glass of orange juice, mm -hmm. but it was blue, you'd be like, what the hell? That, right. that doesn't taste right. Your head would, would fuck up a little bit and then you'd be all right. So it's it's just like that sort of reaction to things, but turned up. A huge amount and sometimes you might see an album cover and you don't think the artwork fits with the music it might be the wrong color right Do you know so these things yeah. are there but they're not for me they're just like really really there <laughs> right it's just part of your day <laughs> yeah yeah is it all the time or is it just when you're in creative mode no it's no it's it's, it's all the time i mean it was uh, it took a while to figure out that other people don't experience the same things Interesting. Um, you know Sorry, I had to ask because it's very interesting to me, and and I yeah, think yeah. it's and I think it definitely adds a something special or different to the whole creative process as well. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's that by putting it putting these things in the bio that these are the things that I actually I want to talk about. I want to get these these awareness of these strange things, unusual things out there. Uh, you know, because I, I've had people talk to me like, "What the hell is that? I, I, that's nonsense. It's making any sense." And you talk to them about it, then it turns out they experience it. All the time. <laughs> really? Yeah. I mean, how can it be nonsense if, you know, if, if that's what you're feeling? It can't be nonsense. It's just yeah. different. You know, we all yeah. go through this in a different way and we're all on the same journey just in on yeah, a different way, I, mean, I think. Yeah. So when I studied photography at university, you go into the science of things like that and like color, different colors have different temperatures and things like that. And so um, everything is everything is linked. It's just that right. most people just can't detect it right. to such a level. I mean, I have it when you have actual synesthesia or chromesthesia, it's, it's actually more than just no, it's debilitating. It can actually be uh, like you get a sensory overload. Like, say, if I'm on stage and the, and the gigs really, we're playing really loud and there's loads of lights, my brain shuts off my sense of smell and my sense of taste. Oh, really? Yeah, it just it, it's overloads. So, do you have to be careful what you, what you do on stage then, or is it, or do you not worry about it and just have to deal with it? Um, I can start to lose my vision if it gets really loud. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, it, it, but you just think, oh, everyone does that. No, no, it's just you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Wow, that's interesting. 
Yeah. And then, so getting back to the uh, the record, um, what was the writing process like? I know you've got a lot of different guests on this. Did you write everything yourself and on your own and then turn the songs over? Or how do you, is it more of a collaborative effort? Uh, I did absolutely everything myself. I recorded everybody else's vocal parts myself. Oh, interesting. And then I sent it to them and I said, here's what to do. If you have absolutely no melodic ideas, then copy what I did. Right. But if you feel inspired, do it your way. And uh, everyone did it their way. <laughs> nice. <laughs> which, which is is great. I mean, used my lyrics and right, sang right. in those parts. I think it, Jenny and Laura, they actually added other bits, like, oh, something should be happening here. And, like, yeah, go ahead. You know. Did, so you do all of the writing. Do you do all of the uh, mixing and producing as well? No, that's uh, Ramage from Ramage Inc. He, he does all the uh, mixing and producing and the recording of the vocals. So in this sort of weird last year we've been in, did you have to send that off? And I mean, in the past, I'm, I'm assuming you were in the room when they were mixing and doing that. Yeah. What, not, were you just getting like uh, daily mixes or something? Yeah, and it, it was uh, such a compromise. And Ramage was like, oh, no, we can't, we can't do it without you there. There's so many right. things. And, and um, But it turned out a lot better because obviously because the music was written by me drawing it as patterns and mathematical equations and right. things because of, of how I do it. Then I made the music fit that. It's actually quite fucking mad to li- <laughs> for people to listen to who don't see the accompanying colour scheme that comes with it. <laughs> right. Do you know what I mean? Which also means it's a bit, it wasn't really that good. So I wasn't there when it was mixed and Ramage mixed it based on what it sounds like. Sounds good to somebody that's only hearing it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so when you get it back then, are you going, what the fuck is that? I was, yeah, I was like, what the fuck is that? But then I was like, that's great. Oh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I was like, yeah. But it, it, so I think we've learned that from now on, I, I'm not going to be at any mixes. It's just so <laughs> you just better. get the dailies and move along? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, yeah, it was uh, a lot better. <laughs> Did you feel, though, that you had lost the, uh, what you had originally intended for it to be does that make sense yeah but but no not not really you know it, it's i suppose it's it, you know it's um one of the problems with, with doing a project that and i was aware of this from the beginning doing a project that is based so heavily on the uh, a structure and a and a concept is that at the end of the day for the average person who's going to listen to it it's not about that it's about tunes it's about, can I stick this on? Can I headbang to this? Right. Can I smoke a weed? To, can I do all right. these things to it? And they don't care about any of that. So it's a creative tool to make a, a good album. And if it gets in the way of it being a good album, then you should you should stop doing it. So I think it was, you know, it was a very important thing to get me to the end point. But the final, the final hurdle, <laughs> the final right. Hurdle, right. you know, was Ramage mixing it purely sonically to sound like a good metal album. And and, so, it, yeah. and I, I think it succeeded. It's it's pretty amazing. Okay. Yeah, cool. Yeah, you know, obviously, I don't can't see where it's coming from when you envisioned it, but from you know, from a regular fan or music listener, it's it's great. Cool, cool. What yeah. um, what do you guys? What do you have planned for? I guess I don't. Maybe it's too early to plan live. You said some have been canceled, but you got anything in the book yet, or is it still all up in the air? Yeah, uh, well, for me, solo, I, I don't play gigs. I've got um band Tommy Concrete and the Wells and we have our own totally different music uh, that we play live uh, and we've we've I think we've got three gigs this year and they just keep getting moved about uh, yeah. I'm I'll, I'll you know I'll believe it after they've happened you know right. no plan on taking your solo stuff out no I mean I would need I would need about 15 people to actually do it yeah. you know but it's it's written it's written from the concept of like, uh, I know I don't, it doesn't have to be played live. So there's no limitations on this isn't possible or anything like that. That was going to be my next question. So when you're writing, you're not worried about how it comes across in a live setting. You're writing the song just for the song's sake and then worrying about live later. Yeah. Well, with my solo stuff, it's never going to be played live, you know? Uh, well, occasionally with the werewolves, we do a couple of songs, but there'll be nothing off this one. Uh, you know, it's just one of them things. I like I like crazy studio albums. 
you know, like the early Satriani stuff, even yeah. though he played it live, you know, but like, like, uh, like, like the just, just mad studio albums where you're really going for as much happening and, and make it all sound crazy. Right. Just load it up and use all the tracks. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and then worry about, but then you see some of those, uh, you're not playing live, but then you see some of those bands live and they can't do half of the shit they did because, you know, it's all quantized and moved around and. Yeah. Yeah, so. completely. I mean, I'd love the, I'd love the budget to do this. I mean, I've thought about my next solo album, actually getting a band or musicians together to create something completely mad and go into the studio that way. But it would just, thing is, is whenever I actually put a guitar in my hand and an amp and volume, I just go into motorhead mode, you know, <laughs> and it's just right. like. I see Lemmy one, behind you. Yeah, completely. Isn't it? <laughs> and AC, motorhead AC DC is, is my two like favorite bands. So when you actually put me in, in a room with a guitar, everything's one and a half minutes long. First chorus, first chorus, right. miles an hour, simple. And that's how I like it as a physical experience playing, you know. Raw but, rock and roll. Yeah, completely, 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 yeah. Uh, but studio-wise, it's more... Um, Perfection more and glossy, yeah. Yeah, Hawkwind Lemmy. Whereas <laughs> <laughs> live, it's Motorhead Lemmy. <laughs> so I don't normally ask the normal, the obvious questions, but I really do want to know, what does Hex and Zirkle mean? Is there a meaning uh, to it? Which is Coven. In, oh, really? In German. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Why? I mean... Uh, because there's more people on this album than uh, any album I've ever had anything to do with, even bands. I think it's maybe mm-hmm. about 11 people have contributed on this. Uh, and it because it was quite... I mean, my wife studies theology and magic, and uh, she was saying that, you know, it's almost like a... Uh, not numerology, but, you know, like the language of, of uh, patterns and rituals and... Mm-hmm. and what I'm doing, like creating sound out of color and all, right. all weird. It's actually, in a way, sort of quite magical and ritualistic. So it was almost like the um, the musicians and everyone on it was all taking part in this, uh, almost like a ritual in a way, you know. Or... So I don't know if this applies or if you even want to answer this, but is there a ritualistic theme to the record? Or is there like a, you know, maybe an occultish theme or something like that? Or is it really just your experiences or a mixture of both, maybe? When I, it, it, well, you see, uh, my wife and me, we share the spare room and it's half of the room is a studio and the other half is an occult library. Oh, really? So it was, yeah. So, <laughs> so I recorded it in an occult library. So right. it's like, you, you, you know, admit where you are and what you're being influenced by, you know, and, and it's the, yeah, so so I, I did actually. Once she suggested that, that was actually what was going on, I embraced it and I made sure that that, that was what was going on. Right. So you you, know. you created the whole vibe there. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I am into a lot of the, I mean, not your your black metal sort of occult, but more more your um, the, the the strange stuff that Killing Joke uh, we're, we're interested in we're, with the occult and just doing like I don't know songs based on. Um, on numbers, some songs based on these weird sort of ideas, you know, mm-hmm. and geometry and all stuff like that, like the Pandemonium album, there's lots of the sacred geometry. And things I was like going to say, I've on. heard of sacred geometry in the past before. Yeah. I don't know much about it, but I know that's a yeah. thing. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not the expert, but I am like sitting a meter and a half away from an expert in the yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> And recording where, you know, where that stuff is going on. So that's kind of interesting as well. Yeah, completely. Yeah, you pick up so, extra any kind of interesting vibes from it, or um, well, it, it's hard to tell. Cause it's where I, it's where I live, but I, I do like to think that you you are influenced by what you're surrounded by, you know. And so there's a very, I mean, there's cats purring on the beginning of one of the tracks, and I decided to stick my, my three cats on it because they were climbing all over me and the studio and the gear the entire time, and it's like. <laughs> you know, that's, They've actually been quite present in this process, so let's stick, <laughs> nice. stick them on. Let's stick them on. So I'm pretty much – I've run through my questions. Did I miss anything you want to cover, Tommy? No, no. I, I, I find that that was really cool. I hope that wasn't too uh, personal. I just was really interested in that kind of stuff. So, No, that's perfect that you're asking because I, I put it out there with that reasoning of people asking questions like that. It's much better than the usual. 
a couple of years ago, and this has nothing to do with anything, but a couple of years ago, I did a film on mental health in the heavy metal community called, uh, All right. actually, it's called Mental Health Out of the Pit. And, you know, I interviewed quite a few bands from around the globe when they were in town or wherever. And yeah, it's not really psychosis or autism based, but it's more like, you know, depression and that sort of thing. And it, yeah. it, did, it did fairly well on the underground. And I know there's a, a need for people to reach out and yeah and connect if that makes sense at all so that's that was yeah. my interest in it i wasn't trying to be nosy at all no that that's great you know i'd like to see see that if you can find me a, a link to it or something hey you know what can i get if you give me your email address i'll leave it off this and i will send it to you tonight yeah that's um it's concrete tommy at googlemail.com okay is it google mail or gmail uh google mail google mail okay i never heard of that but yeah. all right i will send it probably tonight i'd love to hear your opinions on it yeah definitely yeah it's pretty good. I mean, it, well, it's pretty good. I mean, it's, it did what I wanted it to do. It, you know, express yeah. the, we're kind of all in this together. And it's funny when you start bringing these things up, how many people who have been quite, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, I relate. <laughs> yes. So there's a, one more thing before I go, if you're interested at all, there's a lady I talked to who works, she's got a podcast out of, I think, San Diego. It's called the check your head podcast. Yeah. And she speaks to people. Her, her shtick is, a half an hour interview with people in the heavy metal world or heavy music world, not just metal, but about their, I hate to use the word metal, mental condition, whatever it may be, whether it's yep. psychosis or, or depression or cutting yep. or whatever. And then she brings in an expert for the next half hour. It's really, really good and very well done. You might right. want to check it out. It's called the check your head podcast. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. I love it. It's, you know, it's, and it gets the point out there that, you know, they're, you're not the only one dealing with depression and you're not the only one dealing with, and then here's how to deal with it or here's how you can find help and that sort of thing, which I love. I think it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. I appreciate you taking the time and being so honest. Yeah, thanks. Be well. Cool I'll chat. send you that link tonight. Thank you. Okay. Cheers. Cheers. Be safe. Bye. Ever wonder what a punch from Elton John feels like or how you cope with having turned down the chance to be in Nirvana? Or what signal Keith Richards gives when he wants you to get the hell out of his hotel room? Fans of Too Much Effie Perspective don't have to wonder, because they've heard these exact stories and a jillion others on our podcast. I'm Alex Hoffman, former tour manager for Radiohead. And I'm musician and comedy writer Alan Keller. On the TMEP show, we get guests like Nancy Wilson from Heart, Jeremiah Freights from The Lumineers, and Modern Family's Julie Bowen to tell us things they may have only shared with their therapist, clergy, or a TMZ stringer. So join us on Too Much Effing Perspective. That's E-F-F-I-N-G Perspective. The only podcast you crank up to 11. Oh.